morning. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome everyone for another cultural storytelling where we share stories about travel, history, food, and more importantly, inspiring people stories. Today, our talk is curated by one of the earliest and longest members of the group, Gary. Gary will share his lifelong passion, amateur video, amateur radio. And uh, he also invites uh, his radio ham friends from Australia, China, India. Uh, so today's topic is really about traveling with airwaves. So with no further ado, I'd like to spotlight Gary and let you talk about your passion for radio hands. Okay, Minji, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is uh, uh, a talk about ham radio, uh, also known as amateur radio. It's a worldwide thing. And uh, Minji, you're going to have to take over letting people in the room. I will. Okay. <laughs> uh, we're having a good time here, Minji and I, uh, jointly working this. So I will start uh, with my program. One of the attendees, we have four, four speakers. You'll see them in just a minute. And uh, um, one of them, uh, Rob in Western Australia is falling asleep at the switch. <laughs> so so uh, we're gonna, we'll have that, uh, that part of it will be early on. So um, here we go. Let's see if I can do this all correctly. Share screen. And we'll start with this right here. OK. International aspects of amateur radio are also known as ham radio. OK, here we go. We have been practicing social distancing for 100 years, just so <laughs> you know. <laughs> this is me. Uh, this, is, uh, this picture is about 67 years old. This guy right here, if, can you see my cursor moving around? Uh -huh. Okay, that is me. I was 12. This fellow that helped me uh, learn about ham radio, he is 34 at the time. Now, Jayo, who will be joining us, because um, I, I will be spotlighting him, is in Shanghai, China. And he is in a group that is has a, um, um, it's a it's a group of youth, kids, younger people, uh, and that's kind of what this is right here. Because this was not my station, this was Dwayne's station, and so he's teaching us. And that's the same thing that uh, Jayo is um, is doing currently. So we'll get to that here in just a minute. That's that's us. That's a 67 year old picture. This one is about seven years old. This is the same guy, but he is now 94 in this picture, and I was 73 in this picture. He's holding the original there that was shot 60 years earlier. Here is my first station. I need to fix something here. Okay. Uh, my first station, I was 13 at the time. And uh, let's see here. Yeah, right. It's working. OK. Then this is a more current station of mine, uh, fairly recently. So I had more gear. <laughs> and uh, then uh, this is my mine today. I don't have very many radios uh, anymore connected to antennas, uh, but I'm doing everything remotely. And that's how I met some of the, in fact, all of the people that um, uh, that you're going to see with me today. This is a radio ham map of the world. Radio hams have call letters like radio stations, television stations, and so on. And this is broken down worldwide. Uh, in the U.S., our call letters start with K or AA or N or W. Uh, England is G or M. Canada is VA through VE right here. 
uh, Brazil as PY. Usually those are the older versions, and then there are other variations today. Um, let's see here. Uh, Australia is VK. China is BY, B-boy, Y-Yankee, BY, and so on. All, every country has their own designation. Russia is usually starts with a U. Okay. Amateur radio, this is a hobby for the 21st century, and now I'm going to duck out here, and Minji's going to run a video called Amateur Radio. See if I can get out here. Okay, Minji? Yeah, do you see the screen now? Yes. in an age of amazing technology but for some people just being a consumer of off-the-shelf gadgets isn't enough if you're bored with this and looking for something more exciting why not take a trip around the world at the speed of light Delta Kilo 8 Lima Golf, this is Mike X-Ray Zero, Sierra Sierra Whiskey. Okay, thank you Frank for coming back to my QRZ call. My name is Adam, as in Alpha Delta Alpha Mike, Alpha Delta Alpha Mike, Adam, Adam is my name. We all love to communicate. Amateur Radio takes you beyond being a mere gadget user. It challenges you by putting you in charge of the technology. The bit that always interested me in the Amateur Radio was always the construction. One of the big things I've been interested in constructing is uh, using the Raspberry Pi in amateur radio because it's a small single board computer. It has a lot of potential, a lot of opportunities. So we're building a radio uh, receiver. Okay. And so I'm just on the part which is the demodulator. This is a hobby with hundreds of different ways to have techie fun. Using this simple ham radio transceiver and a good antenna, you can talk to other amateurs around the world and you can do it from almost anywhere. I'm at a portable station. The radio signals you transmit travel around the world at the speed of light. No internet connection or mobile phone signals are needed. Just your own skills as a radio ham. I'm 11 years old and I'm about to do the foundation license here in England, over. I got into amateur radio really to get a greater understanding of technology. I spend so much time on my phone, on laptops, and really have no idea how any of it works. It was a really, really welcoming experience for me, um, a really great community, and really, really easy to actually do. In disaster situations, when normal communications are out of action, amateur radio still gets the message through which is why many hams belong to organisations that train their members to provide emergency radio links when needed. I like the practicality of being able to send a message and know how to get something out to someone under your own steam, so kind of making it yourself. And I'm very interested in being able to do the electronics, being able to build things, being able to be self-reliant. Um, in communication, I think that's really interesting. It's great fun talking to other hands in unusual and sometimes exotic places around the world and beyond. The International Space Station carries ham radio gear on board and there's always licensed amateurs among the crew to use it, such as Commander Doug Wheelock. Uh, I've really enjoyed using the ham radio and uh, talking to ham radio operators all over the world. Radio amateurs around the world also build and launch their own satellites, and hams anywhere can use them for space communication experiments. And of course, to chat to each other. Golf 1 X-Ray India Echo. Uh, Golf 1 X-Ray India Echo, uh, Golf Bravo 1 Yankee Oscar Tango America afternoon, uh, five and nine. We're using SA50, which is an FM uh, transponder uh, satellite which was going over from uh, about west to north, around uh, 70 degrees elevation. 
When computers and radios come together, there's a whole bunch of new opportunities for hands to connect by radio, send in text, transmit in pictures or real-time video, even displaying data from an amateur radio satellite orbiting the Earth. Mike is 6, November, Yankee Kilo. CQ, 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 GB1, Yota. I got started in amateur radio because I'm a girl guide leader and I wanted to take up a hobby that I could do with my brownies. The interesting aspect of amateur radio is that you do learn how it works and um, you get to communicate with loads of different people, find out about different areas of the world. You learn a bit more about the science of how it works and you have a much more profound understanding of something, a technology that is going on all around you. In amateur radio, sport and radio fit together well too. I'll take another bearing in a minute because I don't trust that. These guys are trying to locate hidden radio transmitters, racing against each other and the clock. Amateur radio is a fantastic hobby for anybody who loves technology. I've only really been involved in the hobby for a really short amount of time and I've been speaking to people all across the world. It's a really, really inviting community. One minute you're speaking to somebody about amateur radio and it leads on to so many other discussions about other different technologies you may not have even thought of. So if you do get a chance, come and join us. That's it, Gary. Thank you. Okay. Yes, very good. Now I'm going to share my screen again, back to where we were, right here. And then I've invited four people. Uh, one is in Shanghai. That is Zhao. Be what his the call letters of the station that he uses is BY4BJA. The other three have their, their own call letters. Um, Jayo will one of these days. And uh, one of them is VU2CDP. That is um, Deepak, and he's in uh, Mumbai, India. Uh, if, if he's, I didn't Hello. see him show. Uh, Deepak is with us. Hello. Can you see me? Yeah. Hey. Hello. You. Hey, Gary. OK, good. And then we have VK6LD and VK6TM. Both of those uh, radio hams, good friends of mine, are in Western Australia, where the two dots are down there at the bottom. <clears throat> okay, the next thing here is, these are kind of like call letter um, postcards. And I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but those are the four people. I made those. The, they have not seen these before. <laughs> Okay, and here's for the uh, radio hams who are going to be talking. The, uh, when you're muted, you can hit the push to talk bar, hit the space bar, and it's the same as a push to talk bar. So now you know. So now for Jayo, Deepak, Rob, and Kim. Here we have Jayo. Now I'm going to see if I can find you. Minji will help, no doubt. Let's see here. And stop this, and now let's see if I can find... Mm. Hi, I have highlighted ah, okay, the spotlight okay. ah, on the radio oh, cards. Good, good. Bye. That's perfect. That's perfect. Okay. <clears throat> Jayo, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, if, you don't, if you don't mind, tell me how old you are. What's your age? Well, I'm 11 years old currently, and at the end of this year, I'll be 12. <laughs> okay. And, and Jayo is in uh, Ch Shanghai, China. Okay, uh, what I would like to have you tell us is uh, what goes on with your youth group when you go to um, the youth station. What do you do there? Well, actually, we practice, we practice listening to radio because currently we aren't actually connecting with other people around the globe. But I suppose we will add, I suppose, later on in summer break. And now we are preparing for the, the ham radio competition in Shanghai that will be at about the 4th of July. Okay. Uh, Zhao Yu and I are going to do a presentation about two months from now on space. Yeah. Now, Zhao Yu is not, uh, not going to be um, uh, on much this morning, but when we get to our presentation on space, he will be at least half the program. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, so that will be lots of fun. Okay, now let's see, uh, Deepak, are you uh, are you able to hear me? Ah, yes, there we go. Okay, great. Okay, yes. Deepak is in Mumbai, India. We probably have, and there's Yvonne <laughs> leaning into the picture. Um, uh, what what uh, caused you, Deepak, to get into? Um, I have really two questions. What caused you to get into ham radio, and why is your English just like mine? <laughs> okay, I'll answer the second question first. You, you know, we were we are part of the Commonwealth, and yes, you know, all the education that we have is a legacy what the British left behind. So English, uh, by default, becomes our default language of communication. So you know, even with my fellow Indians, because we have so many languages, we tend to communicate more in English than any other language with each other. So you know, it, it just becomes so much easier to build bridges than you know with people with the rest of the world. So that's Excellent. question number two. Uh, <laughs> yes, but I'll go back to the main question as to why did I take up amateur radio in the first place? Well, my, like most people who get into the hobby, um, Gary, you would know, but for the uh, benefit of the audience today, we have uh, a group called the Shortwave Listeners. You know, we, we abbreviate that as SWL. And I didn't know I was a shortwave listener, to be honest. You know, I was a kid and we, ha we had my grandfather's radio in the house. And, you know, I was naturally very curious to where all this music and all the broadcasts were coming in. And I was always interested in science. So, you know, when I, my school had a science club and I would always go and make it a point to read the magazines. And that's how I came across uh, ham radio in one of the magazine articles. So that led to a lot of more curiosity about how radio works and a eventual career in engineering. Uh, ham radio happened quite by chance. I mean, I had put it all behind me until I got into engineering and I ran into the local club who were running classes for the license. So I ended up uh, signing up and then it's been a rocking affair with amateur radio since it's been what, almost 20 years now. I'm 38. Yeah, and yep, I started pretty early in amateur radio, if you can say. Excellent, very, very nice. Okay, let's move on to Rob. Rob is in um, Perth, Australia, uh, and Rob uh, runs the uh, station that I use as my uh, remote station. So, Rob, you're online. Tell us about uh, Ham Radio and Perth, and what I'd like to know from you is how is uh, Perth different than what you know of as the U.S.? How are you? Good evening, Gary. Good evening to the International Explore Culture Group yeah. from Down Under. Um, well, how does it differ? I don't, well, we're, we're very remote here. I think um, Perth is one of the most remote sort of uh, capital cities in the world. Um, I think there's only maybe one or two other remote. So um, radio here um, is very much, um, what could you say, uh, the, a bit of a closed circle, really, because... Um, uh, over on the east coast of Australia, um, the distances between um, a lot of the uh, cities is quite close. So um, uh, people uh, do venture out and uh, get lots of uh, contacts and communication between uh, areas, whereas here we're a bit more isolated and uh, we tend to, uh, I think, talk to each other more. Uh, the Gary um, is the way sort of uh, amateur radio in WA um, has operated. Uh, now with um, a lot of internet sort of based stuff, linked stuff, it... Um, uh, we uh, we are branching out and uh, finding uh, new uh, new friends there, uh, Gary. <laughs> like me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very good. When you and Jude go out for dinner, what do you have that's uh, different than uh, what we would experience in the U.S.? Um... <laughs> I'm not sure because I've never been to the US. Uh, I'm, I'm very much a, a home home person. I sort of travel a little bit overseas, but I just love holidaying everywhere in Australia. Um, it's just such a um, a diverse you know place from the the north with the uh, crocodiles and uh, everything else that uh, um, is dangerous to human beings to the uh, to the south coast, which is uh, uh, almost uh, sub Antarctic uh, at times there. So. Um, what do we eat here? Oh, we uh, well, Australia has, has benefited from a lot of uh, migration over the last uh, well since probably World War Two, and you know, so um, it uh, had a lot of people from Europe after the war, and then um, um, sort of in the seventies, a lot of people from uh, Southeast Asia, and now um, into the well, the twenty first century. There, we have a lot of people uh, from the Middle East, um, from India, uh, from all over the world, who have migrated. So um, our um, 
our food tastes here and our, our menus are uh, are very uh, very diverse. So uh, we get to eat lots of uh, lots of international cuisine as well as um, uh, barbecues and um, other traditional Australian things. There, Gary. <laughs> okay, very good. Super, Rob. Rob uh, says he's falling asleep in the chair, so uh, so I'll move on to to. Uh, Thank you, Gary. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm in dark and room as well. So <laughs> um, uh, we'll move on to to Kim. Uh, Kim is also in South, in Western Australia, and uh, however, a little further south uh, in Margaret River. Kim, can you? Uh, is your yeah? I think you're. I think it's working okay now. Hopefully, yes. Can you uh -huh. hear me? Yes, yes. Very good. Okay. You're on. Go ahead. Right. Well, my father was the uh, big amateur radio operator in the family. Um, he was in uh, reconnaissance corps in the uh, World War II, and he was operating radio as part of his duties. Um, and he got into amateur radio after the war. And uh, wherever he was posted after the war, he was in the army for 20 years. Um, he um, was... Uh, also uh, operating an amateur radio. Um, and then he, when we came out to Australia in 67, he brought the hobby with him and he was very keen out here. And uh, I got uh, into electronics when he built me a little transistor radio um, when I was um, eight years old um, and uh, got into amateur radio after that uh, and got my uh, full license uh, in uh, 1980. Um, and it wasn't uh, particularly active. Um, I got it went into computer software and uh, I spent 25 years in UK Europe uh, as a contractor and uh, so uh, working in software and not operating amateur radio. Um, and then when I came back here four years ago, um, I got back into the hobby. Um, and uh, so, so uh, now operating, uh, well, using my father's antennas, et cetera, but uh, using all new equipment. Uh, Gary? It's very good. Now you have some strange critters in your backyard, is that right? Yes, certainly do, and I got a presentation on the music. <laughs> okay, let's see if we can do this. I, um, uh, Minji, I don't know how this is going to work. Uh, Kim has, uh, he can share his screen. What happens if, okay, Kim, try to do that. Let's see if uh, that works. So Kim, would you like to share your screen? You should be able to do that. Okay, so can you see that? Yes. yes. Right. Okay. Let's get that up. Okay. So um, this is the uh, presentation. You want me to go ahead? Yes. Okay. So this is uh, Tales from Down Under, Margaret River, Western Australia. Uh, Margaret River area. Margaret River is located in the southwest of Western Australia, in the middle of the bit sticking out close to the coast. It is a medium-sized country town which is located at the center of a premier world-class wine growing region. There are many good restaurants and many of the wineries have restaurants attached. And it is famous for a wide range of sporting events, including its international surfing carnivals. And it has a full range of beaches catering for many different users. Margaret River Town. The area was originally settled in the mid to late 1800s but, and was expanded after World War II via land grants. The 70s saw the start of the modern expansion where there has been a lot of building and a lot of agriculture added. It's a couple of the hotels and, or a hotel and a pub. We've got a few hotels and pubs, of course, and very, very important to Australians. Um, art galleries, we've got quite a lot of art galleries um, and uh, qu quite a lot of shops. Uh, and uh, modern boutiques. These boutiques actually are at Quarum up, which is the next town up. And the area has many beautiful white and yellow sand beaches and spectacular coastline. That's also the Indian, or I mean, that's the Indian Ocean. Uh, yes, well, that's, we're at the confluence between the Indian Ocean and the Southern Ocean. So depending upon which ocean you're getting, you're either getting hot water or cold water. <laughs> Can you swim in the summer? Yes, you can swim in the sea. Um, it depends upon which beaches you go to. Some beaches are uh, much more rougher than other beaches. Um, but you, you've got a full choice of beaches. So yes, you can certainly do that. Um, and the, the, the beach here on the right is the International Surfing Beach. 
and, and a picture on the left just, just looking down towards southern beaches from that beach. Um, it, it has a, a lot of forests, uh, extensive uh, national and state forests, uh, along with walking and uh, trekking trails. There's the Cape to Cape Trail, which is a, the, the big trekking trail, but there are a lot of trails um, through all the forests. Um, this is uh, Boron Up Forest on the left. Uh, there are three main uh, eucalyptus trees, uh, the hardwoods, Jarrah and Carrie, and there's also Mary, along with tea trees and quite a lot of other bushes, etc. Um, and there is uh, extensive agriculture, um, beef, uh, dairy, um, sheep. Uh, sheep is both for the meat and also a lot of it's for wool. Um, the beef uh, is for beef, meat, and uh, also for the dairy. Um, and uh, all sorts of crops um, and uh, all the vineyards and uh, a lot of specialty stock and crops. And that's uh, looking along uh, Burnside Road, which is just uh, down the road from here. Um, we have a lot of historic buildings. Um, this is Ellen's Brooks House, which is uh, next to Ellen's Brook, which is on the right. Um, and uh, these were original settlers. So this is one of the original settlement houses. Um, and now out to the tales in question. In the bush close to Margaret River, the town has many bush blocks dating back to the mid 70s, when various subdivisions of rural land were made. This meant that people could buy bush blocks that are typically six acres to 10 acres in size, my parents being among them. On the block, there are many critters. There is much wildlife kangaroos, ruse. Uh, this guy's name is Flash. Uh, many years ago in Outback Australia, well, in February last year in the wilderness of Margaret River, Western Australia, there was a kangaroo called Flash. So called because he is a Flash kit. The first day Flash turned up, he stood in front of the feeding trays demanding to be fed. An arrogant, aggressive, and immensely stupid adolescent boomer. Um, male kangaroos um, are called boomers. Uh, the, the, the adult males. Um, how he expected to be fed, hand fed, eating straight out of the punnet, I don't know. So I put the food straight back into the food bin in the garage. He came right up to the garage and we had a stand up shouting match. Needless to say, he didn't get fed. Flash thinks he owns the property. He is a good looker and he sure knows it. Spring, summer and autumn, he is chasing the ladies, everything hanging out. He thinks he that he has access to all areas. Bounces over the top of the water tank, I had to install rails and onto the patio. <laughs> Spent the morning building and installing a gate to keep him out. <laughs> It didn't work. <laughs> I had to also put up an obstacle course of bricks at the other end to keep him out. However, he is persistent. Roos leave a trail of rupu wherever they go, or especially the males. Um, and Flash has uh, left his all around the house. So he's been getting in as close as he can. Now this guy's name is Mr. Big. Mr. Big has a very nice character. He mostly hangs about in the background and keeps an eye out for his doe and uh, Joey. He takes no nonsense, especially not from Flash. Just hanging about. We regularly get visits from does with the Joeys. Most of the, the Joeys are very keen to get out. A few others overstay in the basement. Marsupial babies are born outside the pouch and are very small. They then crawl up into the pouch where they continue to gestate at home with the family. Kim's cuties. <laughs> and I might add that uh, Kim has taken all these pictures. Oh, right. A lazy day with the family. <laughs> K 
kangaroos can grip objects in much the same way that uh, humans can. Um, they they do, do like eating bread, but I have to uh, limit the amount of bread because it can be very bloating. Um, but uh, I, they do get the odd scraps of bread and they'll pick it up in their hands to eat. Kangaroos are dinos in fur. They are constructed in much the same way as dinosaurs. And uh, a word of caution. If any of you ladies are out in the bush and there is a boomer close by, whatever you do, don't bend over. We are sure to be in for a big surprise. <laughs> so we've got a question here. Uh, how mm. dangerous it is to have kangaroos so close around the house every now and then? Uh, it, it is dangerous. Um, they've got claws um, and uh, they can disembowel you with their feet. So you, you have to know what you're doing, what, how to act with the kangaroos around. They don't seem to be shy of people, are they? Uh, no, they're not shy of people. Um, they, they growl. Um, they, they, so they don't make tutting noises like Skippy. That, that's total fiction. But they, but they do growl. Um, and um, so they, they, if they're getting upset or whatever, they'll, they'll growl. Um, but uh, yeah, you've got to be careful of them. Um, I mean, I stand up to them and I don't take any nonsense from them, but I know how to handle them. And do they live usually as a group, as a family, or are they solo animals? Uh, it's a combination, really. Um, they, they're very individual. Uh, they've got all their own individual characteristics. Um, so they're very, they're very like humans, actually. Um, but uh, I mean, some of the time they'll, they'll be uh, uh, completely alone. Other times they'll be with other kangaroos. Uh, we've got a golf course fairly close by and the golf course has got a lot of grass on it and they love eating grass. Um, so there's a lot of them on the golf course. Um, and of course they, they get in the way of the balls flying along the golf course. Um, and they can be a bit of a nuisance over there. Um, but uh, generally speaking, they don't uh, cause any uh, physical problems to the uh, golfers. Um, probably once a year, they, there's a cull, um, but it's only sort of one or two shots. And it's only if there's a, a boomer getting uh, particularly aggressive. Um, so, but generally speaking, it's not, not a problem. I see. Um, okay, other critters. In addition to the roos, we have many other critters, such as a good range of birds, including blue book owls, and they actually make a, a cuckooing noise, so they sound like an English cuckoo. Um, black and white cockatoos, uh, magpies. We've got uh, five magpies who are the uh, um, building committee, and uh, with all the building work I've been doing around the house, they come down for an inspection every now and then and walk through the latest building work. Um, we've got crows um, and pink galahs, um, 28s, uh, which are Australian ringneck parrots, uh, bronze wing pigeons, a lot of the uh, pigeons, and um, a large variety of small birds, including splendid fairy wrens, uh, bobtail lizards and racehorse goannas, and plenty of skinks. Skinks are, are fairly small lizards. Um, and we've got a bandicoot, who's absolutely lovely. Uh, and a few snakes. We, we very rarely see the snakes. They keep well away. They don't bother us. We don't bother them. Um, carpet pythons are harmless and they live up in the roof spaces. Uh, dugites and brown snake, snakes are the uh, ones to avoid. Um, the odd rabbit, but they seem to be, be uh, they seem to get eaten by the odd feral cat. I haven't see, seen the feral cats for a while, but I have seen uh, rabbits say, oh, about three months ago. That's a bandicoot. Um, this guy used to visit a few years ago, then moved over near the road for a couple of years, then moved back last year. He's now a regular visitor day and night and no longer skitty. He's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, cockatoos, um, they like to sit at the tops of trees and pick off nuts with their beaks and uh, rain them down on the ground and on anyone who is who's underneath. Parrots. Um, so that's the, the. There are a variety of parrots that we, down in Margaret River, but this is the main one we get actually. You sometimes see a Rosella, but uh, it's mainly this one. 
uh, and the Galahs. Um, the Galahs mate for life, and they can be such characters. They can, uh, as you can see, there's a little story being shown here. And so I've got a few of those little stories where they, uh, they seem to be uh, talking, etc. cetera. Um, and the small birds is a very large variety, but uh, they're difficult to photograph as they often flitter around. So I aimed the camera at them and they moved. So difficult to catch them. Um, I have feeding shelves at the front and the back of the house. They, they, they like to knock on the windows. So I put out uh, feeding shelves and uh, put frozen meal, meal uh, worms, which they love on the shelves. So I quite regularly see them coming onto the shelves and uh, saying hello through the window. And uh, that's a, another bird. And that's a bobtail lizard that they come out in summer. Oh. Yeah. And, and that's the presentation. Hope you okay. enjoyed that. Excellent. Very good. That worked out fine, Kim. Okay. Now let me. Um, oh, uh, Minji, are you ready with the other one? Oh, the uh, yes. I got a real, so. real short real short video that has to do with Kim. Yes, so I am just going to find the PowerPoint slides and they share with us. Uh, it's... This is called a street fight, an Australian street fight. <laughs> Are they dancing? <laughs> You're, we have street fights here in the U.S. and Chicago and New York and Los Angeles, but that's that was uh, where Kim lives. <laughs> well, that's actually from Eastern States, but it's uh, <laughs> oh, a, a it? YouTube video. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, I'm going to share my screen again. And oh, I didn't jump back and forth. All right, I didn't. Uh... So first, I had we had um, Jayo. And then we had uh, Deepak, and then we had Rob, and then we had uh, Kim and Margaret River. Okay, now the there were some slides on the International Space Station in the video that we saw at first. I've got four more just to tell you that there are radio hands aboard the International Space Station. This is a collection of the crew in the International Space Station. Uh, obviously, uh, it's uh, weightless. There is no gravity or microgravity. And so uh, these people are having a good time with that part, uh, getting used to that also. Uh, here is an astronaut. So this is Suni Williams. She was the commander at, at, during that uh, period of time at the space station. And she's talking regularly to students at various schools. What we do is we set up... Um, connections to the International Space Station, particularly with schools, because uh, the NASA enjoys the uh, publicity with the students and the students love talking to the um, to the um, astronauts. So here's one of the students talking to the space station. Really fun. OK, the next thing. We're talking about culture here with amateur radio. It's all over the world. And here we have ham radio in Antarctica. Now, this is, happens to be the Casey station. That's the Australian station, one of the Australian stations. And this fellow's call is VK0PD. The VK0 indicates Antarctica. Um, Kim's call is VK 
6 TM, Tango Mike. And so uh, VK6 is Western Australia. This one is VK0, which is Antarctica. Okay. By the way, I meant I was going to tell you this. This is uh, Paul, and he is not outside. That's a double picture. Uh, you don't go outside like this. <laughs> okay. Next thing is this is the South Pole. Happens to be Barry Goldwater, who was a, a um, senator at the time. And he is at the Mudson uh, Scott station, which the call letters are KC4AAA at the South Pole. Okay, now I've got an, an, a PowerPoint presentation, very short. And uh, let me see how we're do we seem to be doing fine on time. I need to stop, come down here to this one, share. Where are we? Right there. Share. Here it is. Okay. Uh, and let's see if I can make this work okay. This is a friend of mine. His, his name is Butch. He's, he lives here where I do in uh, uh, Florida on the East Coast at Melbourne, Florida. His call is WA4AQV. He was at the South Pole in 1978. But here's a little bit of information about the South Pole. And we have uh, where that dome there is where he was living. We'll get to that. Here's what happens. A company, an electronics company, ran an ad in the Orlando Sentinel and also in the LA Times. Uh, Butch answered the ad, and the ad was, would you like to have an exciting and adventurous position somewhere? And it's going to be at the South Pole, all right? So he says he answered the ad, had a couple of interviews, and now he says, the next thing you know, you're at the South Pole. The temperature there was 65 degrees below zero. Wow. That's Fahrenheit. And he says the watch was rubbing its hands together. <laughs> okay. And you'll notice the plane has skis. And they also the engines never stop running. When the plane comes in, they don't dare stop the engines because they can't get them restarted at that temperature. Here's the front door on the way into the dome. And this is where they live. Now, the funny thing about this is they're living in freezers, but they're reversing the use of the freezer. So the temperature outside the freezer is minus 30 to minus 114 degrees below zero. And so inside the freezer, they're using warm heaters. So they've reversed the, the use of the, of the freezers. They're no longer freezers on the inside, the freezers on the outside. So the people are living inside the these freezers, brought up to normal uh, room temperature. Coldest place in the world, yep. And the reason for bringing all of this together is that uh, that's the fun of ham radio, international ham radio, talking to unusual places and unusual cultures. Okay, notice that when the wind blows, it gets warmer. That's because the wind is always from the north, and it's warmer in the north. Surface elevation is 9,300 feet, and 9,200 feet of that is white ice under your feet. One day is one year long, five months of daylight, then you have a sunrise, then five months, well, I've got it backwards, you have a sunset, then five months of night, then you have a sunrise. <laughs> And during the uh, daylight, the sun goes all the way around the horizon every day. Here's the radio station at the South Pole. Um, they, it's, this is an older picture, but um, it, it would be fine today, even today. Those are Collins uh, radios. This is the call letters, KC4AAA. This uh, slide is out of focus. I'm sorry. It, the, that's the way it was with his slides that he sent me. This is the antenna, six element, 20 meter beam, mono bander. Here's the radio room, radio, main radio room. Uh, John Osborne is one fellow on the left and uh, Kath Locklear is on the right. Kath is sitting in front of a teletype machine, radio teletype. Here's the voice position. Those are Collins uh, transceivers. And what they do for recreation is they build igloos. 
and that's all of that one. Okay, let's see how I do this. There, now we're back. Okay, and then we go back to share screen again, right here. And, okay, people have cards. These are called QSL cards, and they're, they're just postcards. That happens to be one of mine. That picture was taken on the beach at the island of Desicheo, which is 12 miles off the coast of Puerto Rico. And I was there and I was talking back to a friend of mine in Puerto Rico. Gary, if I may interrupt, Desicheo, sure. for your information, is ultra rare, ultra rare for this part of the world. You know, the oh, last yes. time there was an expedition, only three guys got into the log. Yeah. One three guys. So, yeah. Next time you go there, you let me know. I'll keep my ears peeled for you. Okay, yes, we'll only stand by for you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. Uh, Australia uh, has the same problem into uh, the Caribbean. It's, it's the, called an antipod. It's the opposite side of the world. Okay, this one is, this picture is old. Uh, it's showing all of these different cards on the wall. For those of you who uh, know, you're going to know who this is because this is the home of Art Collins. This picture was taken in 1925. Art started his company, Collins Radio, in 1933 or 34. And so, um, but at this time, he just was a radio ham building his own equipment. You can see the, slide, the cards on the wall. There's a close-up of that. You'll notice one other thing for those of you who are the hams in the group. There are no letters on the front. This was before letters were signed. Were, were assigned. We just had num numbers and then other letters for the call letters. Later, the W was on the front for the United States. G was on the front for England and so on. This one, if you look down at the lower right, you'll see the call letters of this station. It's HV0A. That is the Vatican in Rome. This is the ham station at the Vatican with a lot of cards on the wall. Now, these are some of the cards that I've gathered over the years, South Africa on the top. Um, and some of these are kind of are on the old side because I've been doing this a long time. Ecuador on the upper right, Yap Island in the Pacific, lower left, and Palmyra Island, lower right in the Pacific. St. Thomas Virgin Islands. Uh, Deepak, that's another difficult one for you because it's the uh, yes. opposite, opposite side. Right. And then uh, Island of Gotland, that is uh, off the coast of Sweden. Lower left is Norway. Lower right is Midway in the Pacific. Here's Canberra. Uh, in, it's the capital of Australia. Uh, Helsinki, Finland on the right-hand side. Uh, Colombia on the left, lower left, and Chile, South America, on the lower right. Here's another one. St. Lucia is in the uh, Caribbean, British West Indies. Uh, Switzerland, HB9. Those are the beginning call letters of stations in Switzerland. Kwajalein in the Pacific, in the um, uh, far western Pacific, and then Northern Marshall. Ireland. Pardon yeah, the Marshall Islands. Yes. Mar that's right, Marshall Islands, and then Northern Ireland. Swan Island is in the Caribbean. Tenerife is in the Canary Islands. That's off the coast of Africa and um, uh, Spain and so on. Mm -hmm. St. Martin is uh, in the Car Caribbean. Yes, go ahead. And then we have the Re Republic of Djibouti. That is in on the uh, east coast of Africa. Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Argentina, Marianas Islands in the Pacific. I have two cards from Saipan. That surprised me. I didn't notice that until later. French Polynesia. In many cases, radio hands will like to have their call letters be their initials. Mine are W4GAL. GAL are my initials. This guy was Pete Metzger. And he, was, he, nor, he lives in Boulder, Colorado, but he went to French Polynesia in order to put that station on the air. Greenland, uh, Korea on the right, Spitsbergen, that is north of Norway. It's a Norwegian 
island, but it's uh, it's the very far north of Norway. And then we have Point Barrow, Alaska, which is the most northern point in the U.S. There's Brazil. Call letters start with PY. Italian radio amateur uh, starts with I. We, the lower left is Germany. The lower right is England, G3. Now, the upper left is on this one. Uh, I'll bet you that guy works for VW <laughs> I, or has one. <laughs> That's Germany. Uh, upper right is uh, Spain. Lower left is Hungary. Lower right is Bermuda in the middle Atlantic. Actually, it's closer to North America. Tasmania, lower uh, right of uh, off the coast of Australia. It's part of Australia. And I didn't notice this, that we have the confusion to some people is Australia versus Austria. Well, they're two separate countries. Austria is <laughs> in Europe. Uh, Bahama Islands in the lower left. And that guy's a good friend of mine. He's no longer living, but uh, he was famous. And he came from Iowa where I did. Below uh, lower right is another card from Austria. These four are Russians. They were at the time. Now, now Azerbaijan is no longer part of, I don't think it's part of the Soviet Union. That's the lower left. Uh, let's see. And the, re the rest are still uh, in, in Russia. Here are two in Japan. Um, Japan starts with J, J-A. That is the, um, years and years ago, it was just the letter J. Then, then they added the second letter. And now there are a number of different um, J-A, J-B, uh, and so on. Lots of different uh, call letters in Japan. There are so many radio. I think Japan is the second most populated uh, radio uh, country in the, with radio hands. The U.S. is first, but not by much. There are a lot of, I think maybe Japan, Japan may be number one in the, in the world as far as radio hands. That's a technology thing. That's a big deal. Japan is highly, techno, highly, highly uh, technology, high technology. Then we have Liechtenstein, which is a very small country in Europe, and Estonia. Top left is England. Top right, there's the other country, uh, the other card from Saipan. France in the lower left and Lithuania in the lower right. San Andreas off the coast of um, uh, Colombia and South America. Uh, the upper right here is the polar station for Russia near Murmansk. Then we have Latvia on the left and Morocco on the lower right. Liberia in Africa, off the coast of Africa, that's West Africa. And then we had Dominican Republic in the Caribbean, Ukraine in Europe, and Canada, North America. Now I have some famous radio hams. W4CGP, he's no longer living, but that's Chet Atkins. He was a very famous guitar artist. Then we have Tim Allen. This is a, a TV program in the US. Uh, called the, the uh, it's a serial called Last Man Standing, and they featured ham radio quite a bit. Tim Allen was the uh, actor in the show, and finally, at the end of the show, he got his ham license. <laughs> so he's not, he's now a technician, licensee. And, and then, we have, then we have this guy. This guy is maybe one of the most famous hams. When he came on the air, he really um, created a stir. Uh, he was, when we were on, on the air, we used our first names. He said his first name is Hussein. Uh, no big deal about that, except hams typically knew who that was. He would call, come on the air. There were hams that would say, I'm sorry, I didn't get your call letters. I only got part of it. Uh, I only got the JY1 part. What's the rest of it? He said, that's all, that's all there is. The reason is JY1 was the king of Jordan. He is... Um, King Hussein. Wow. He's no longer living, but he was a very active radio ham. If you want more information about ham radio, you can email me. That's my uh, email address, Gary at W, that's my call letters, W4GAL.com. And that's the end of the story.
Mr. Gary, I have one question. Where did you get those cards? Are they um, uh, people you have spoken with in those oh, countries? And, oh, uh, oh, yes. Oh, and yes. They, and they mail those to you? Oh, yes. And okay. I mail one. Usually, people in the U.S. are not, um, we're not rare. So, therefore, we are on the, on the pleading end. Please send me your card. And so, uh, so but that's how, how we do it. Now, uh, that's a lot of... Um, a lot of hands today don't do that anymore because it's all electronic. You can get an electronic card from somebody. I like the, the real old time postcards. They're lots of fun. And okay. the Mr. Walter Cronkite. Ah, uh, yes. Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite was a radio ham. Yeah. And Donnie Osmond. Hmm. Um, <laughs> so that's, uh, that's it. We're done. Uh, Manji, it's back to you. Oh, uh, Gary and all the radio hands from Australia, from India, and from China, thanks for providing uh, such an uh, interesting introductory <laughs> uh, about your hobby and the kangaroos in your backyards and uh, your story with radio hand. Uh, it's definitely really informative and very interesting for us who are Radio Ham to Bees, maybe in the future. Uh, this is very well curated. Thank you so much, Gary. Fantastic. Um, I would now uh, like to spotlight, let's see if I can spotlight uh, Ploy here, um, because Ploy is going to introduce our special event on 4th of July. Over to you, Ploy. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today. And thank you, Gary, and everyone who's on um, the talk today. Um, next week, the 4th of July, we are doing um, Pacific Time Friendly, which is going to be on 4 p.m. GMT or 5 p.m. London time or noon Eastern time or 9 a.m. Pacific time. So next week, we are doing a collaboration between me um, some chefs from Indonesia and Vietnam. And we have a special guest from Disney Animation Studio who will be um, talking about Raya and the Last Dragon. So if you haven't had a chance to watch the movie, um, you can watch a movie before the talk, but you are not required. We don't require you to watch the movie. We will be talking about the food in the movie, the main um, purpose of the movie is about um, having food to bring people together. And that will be a um, cooking demonstration by me. And then we will go over the interview with Fawn, who is the head of story of the Disney animation studio, who has been working on Frozen movie, Moana, Zootopia um, and this one, um, Raya and the Last Dragon. And um, then we will discuss, have a panel discussion about the food appear on the movie that appear in those eight, um, Southeast Asian countries in different forms. So we have a lot of foods we share in common. We call differently, we call the food differently and have different um, ingredients and different aspects, but very similar. So we will talk about those food that uh, we ap that appear in the movie. So we hope that you can make it next week with the special um, schedule. And um, yes, we are looking forward to that. Thank you so much, Ploy, for curating a collaborative project. Uh, we know there are quite a few Southeast Asian countries next to each other. Uh, they speak different languages, they have different histories and cultures, but it's really the food that connects them together. Uh, we watched this Disney animation movie, Raya and the Last Dragon. We really like the theme of how um, people can unite with food and with empathy uh, to um, connect with each other. So that will be 4th of July, Pacific timely friendly event for coming Sunday. And if you like what we do, you can join us on our Facebook group to continue the discussion about lifestyles, culture and food and travel, or follow us on Instagram. 
Thank you very much again for the food lovers in the group and for the radio hands in the group and whoever who comes and enjoy it today. So hopefully we will see you next week. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 <laughs>